Testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, In Defense of Atheism. Now, when I say the title is In Defense of Atheism, I'm not going to give a long, drawn-out treatise on why I think atheism is the best philosophy to live with. Instead, when I talk about atheism, it is a subject that is inextricably tied up with my dad because my dad was an atheist. And I am releasing this episode in honor of my dad on the eve of Father's Day weekend 2024 for that very reason. That's why I'm releasing it now. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about my father, the fact that he was an atheist, the way in which he carried his atheism, and how it is that over the years I've been able to see more and more positive things in his belief system than I did when I was a faithful and observant Mormon. My dad's first name was Raymond. He was old enough to be my grandfather. Indeed, my mother was old enough to be my grandmother. I came along rather late in life, and so I ended up being raised by parents who grew up as teenagers during the Great Depression. My father was born on December 26th, 1919. That is a year and about 45 days after World War I was over. I was born when my dad was 40 years old and my mother was, oh, a few years younger than that. My dad attended the University of Colorado during late 1930s, early 1940s, where he was a band leader. Big bands were a big thing back then, and he had his own band at the University of Colorado that he was the conductor, and he played the clarinet, sort of like Benny Goodman, a very famous big band leader from that time period. At the University of Colorado, he studied and graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering, and he worked at the Pentagon during World War II, as well as at some other times after that. His flat feet gave him a 4F, so he was not able to serve in the active military, but he did his bit for the nation's war effort by working at the Pentagon. He also, after World War II, worked extensively in wind tunnels, and he had to move where the wind tunnels were, and where he moved, the family moved with him. He actually founded the Supersonic Wind Tunnel Association in 1954. He wrote an article on it for Encyclopedia Americana, I think it was, not the Britannica, but the Encyclopedia Americana. And I remember having this interesting experience when I was over in Japan on my mission for two years, and I and my companion were over at an investigator's house and I noticed that they had an encyclopedia set on their shelf. And it was the Encyclopedia Americana. And I went over and I found the W's. I looked up Wind Tunnel. I went through the article. It wasn't that long. And I saw my dad's name printed there. And at that moment, even though I was on the far side of the Pacific Ocean, from my dad, from home, from the United States, I felt a strange kind of closeness to him. Looking at his name at the end of that article in that encyclopedia volume in Japan. My parents had three boys, I am the youngest, and I mentioned that they had to move around a lot because they have to go where the wind tunnels are. The locations where all three of us boys were born could not illustrate that fact any better. The oldest son was born in 1955 in Lone Star, Texas. The next son was born in 1958, three years later, in Arlington, Virginia, and then I, the youngest, was born in 1960 in Palo Alto, California. So you can see how much we moved all around the country, even during those early years. My dad had a lot of favorite expressions. And most of his expressions, now that I look back on them, had to do with the value of work and hard work. In fact, one of his expressions that he said quite often was, all work and no play makes Jack, and lots of it. Now, that particular expression doesn't make a lot of sense unless you know that Jack is a very old expression for money. So all work and no play makes Jack or money and lots of it. See, once you know that Jack means money, it makes sense. But once again, it illustrates his philosophy about life. He would also frequently quote this little bit of doggerel verse. I burn my candle at both ends. It cannot last the night. But oh, my foes and ah, my friends, it makes a lovely light. Yep. Once again. He was kind of a workaholic. I got to tell you that about my dad, if you can't guess it from his favorite sayings. The third favorite saying he had that I'll share with you has to do 
with the epitaph that he said he wanted on his gravestone. Here lies Radio Free Mormon's dad, retired yesterday. He said that a lot. Yep, he was going to work himself right up to the last day he died. So you can see that one of the values that he had in life that was very much instilled in him was the value of work. This came out even in the books that he would read to me as a child. He would read to me and to my brother, the next oldest brother. We were about the same age. We shared a bedroom for the longest time. And he would come in when we were young at evening time, bedtime, and read us stories. And the stories that I remember that he would read, one of them was The Little Engine That Could. I think I can, I think I can. And the other one was The Little Red Hen, which definitely talks about the value of work. So these were the values that he instilled in me as well. Now, when I was a teenager, I think he almost despaired of me because I was not into work at all. Not hard work, not light work, no work whatsoever is what appealed to me. And I know that that caused him a lot of chagrin. He was worried that I might live out my entire life that way. And he would say to friends frequently with me in earshot, he would say about me, my son is not afraid of work. He can lie down right beside it and go to sleep. Well, as it turned out, he didn't have anything to worry about because during my mission, I began to develop a very strong work ethic. Maybe not as strong as his, but strong enough to still be good enough. And I think hopefully be healthy. At least it's worked for me. Sometimes I worry that I do work too much at the expense of paying attention to other things that might be needful. There has to be a balance there, as we all know. Now, I will also let you in on this secret. You know that every episode I start with testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. That is from my dad. That is in honor of my dad. Because back in the day when I was a kid, he had a tape recorder. And in those days, tape recorders were not digital. And this one was not even a cassette tape. These are the tape recorders that had two big reels on them, two big circles, and the tape on one would play through and then be wound up on the other reel. And before my dad recorded anything, he wanted to make sure that it was working. So he would pick up the microphone, push record, and say into the microphone, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. And then he'd play it back and see if it were recording, if it were at the correct volume, and then he'd go on from there. But I never forgot how he would always say testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three, in order to test the volume of the tape player back then. And I carried that over into the opening of Radio Free Mormon. So now you know where that comes from. I'm going to start talking about my dad's atheism here in just a second. But before I get to that, I need to play a word from our sponsor. Hello, friends of Mormon Discussion Incorporated. I'm Bill Real, founder and CEO, reaching out to our incredible community. Our mission is to support those examining the truth claims of Mormonism and those redefining their relationship with it. Our acclaimed lineup of podcasts, including Mormonism Live, Radio Free Mormon, Mormon Discussion, and others offers a space for truth and healing, but we need your help. Your donations power our work, expanding our outreach, improving our content, and creating new initiatives. Visit mormondiscussions.org, click the donate button, and make a difference today. Donate to your favorite show, like this one, as your support empowers us to empower others. Thank you for being a part of the change. Together, we're making real impact. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Real, for that wonderful announcement. So let me go on to talk about my father and his atheism. Now, the first thing you need to know is that he was not a militant atheist. He did not wear his atheism on his sleeve. We celebrated Easter and we celebrated Christmas in kind of a secular sort of way, but we didn't go to church for either of them. In fact, there was only one time that I can recall growing up that we went to church for any kind of a church service, and it was in Easter of 1968, as it turned out. You know, when you move around a lot when you're a kid, it's easier to remember certain years and where you were when because you're in different places so often. That's how I can remember it was Easter of 1968. We were in Longview, Texas that year, my second grade. Just that one year where we lived in the apartments, and then we moved again. So I know exactly where we were. During the school year, my second grade, 67 to 68. My dad expressed his views more on the subject of atheism as I began to become religious in 1978. But he never gave any kind of explanation to me as to why it was he was an atheist. 
he didn't seem to feel it was incumbent upon him to convert me to his views. It was just that when I began to study Mormonism and I started talking about getting baptized into the LDS church, which I did in June of 1978, lo these 46 years ago now, this month, wow, amazing how time flies. Now, my dad had nothing against religion in particular. He called it sometimes a crutch that people needed to lean on. Now, that always sounded kind of supercilious to me, like he's the kind of guy who's strong enough and healthy enough in his belief, atheism, that he doesn't need a crutch called religion. And maybe it was a little bit supercilious, but I remember that that is what he would say. But he didn't talk about it a lot, and usually I was the one who brought the subject up. As I said, I was getting ready to join the Mormon church, and my dad did not get in the way. He did not try and talk me out of it. In fact, he was quite supportive. The only thing he said was one thing about my joining the Mormon church, and that was it was fine by him if I joined the church under one condition, and that one condition was don't try and convert me. And so I never did. My brother, the one who was born in 1958, had joined the Jehovah's Witnesses about a year before I joined the LDS church. And my dad talked with him and gave him the exact same condition. Fine if you join, just don't try and convert me. But when I was baptized early on a Saturday morning, it was an unusual time for a baptism, but there were things going on, lots of conflicts in the schedule that I had to be baptized very early on a Saturday morning. And I had a lot of friends there, but I will always remember that my dad also got up and came down to the church and sat there and supported me by being present when I was baptized. That was my dad, the atheist. But my mom, the nominal Christian, she didn't make it. But my dad was there. I remember that. And when it came to my going on my mission to Japan in 1979, between the two of my parents, it was my dad who was the most supportive. My mom was very worried about losing her baby for two years. On the other hand, my dad thought it was a good idea for me or anybody for that matter to live in a foreign country for a period of time and two years was a good period of time in his mind before going to college or while going to college in that my dad felt it gave a person some good rounding and life experience to be in a foreign country for a prolonged period of time early on in life. And so he was supportive of my mission. I want to tell you a story that happened when I was probably about six or seven years old. We were in Texas. We lived in Waco during this time period, Waco, Texas, back before it was as famous for certain things as it is today. Every summer, my dad would have a vacation. He would take the family often down to the coast at Padre Island, which is down at the very southern tip of Texas on the Gulf Coast. And we had a thing that we did. He would take us three boys out deep sea fishing when we were down there. And there was an individual who had a deep sea fishing boat. His name was Captain Collie. My dad liked him. They got along. So whenever we went to Padre Island and wanted to go deep sea fishing, Captain Collie was the man that my dad called up, made the appointment. We went down there early in the morning. We spent the day out deep sea fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. And then we come back in the afternoon with whatever it was we caught and then take our fish to a faucet at the end of the dock to clean them before taking them home. Now, the story I'm gonna tell you has to do with after the deep sea fishing on the dock while we are waiting in line with our fish to clean them at this little faucet. And I recall that it was, of course, a very hot day. It's summer, it's the Gulf of Mexico, it's Padre Island. But being six or seven, I seem to be a little bit more inured to the heat than I am today. I know it was hot because it had to be hot. I didn't feel it as much then as I seem to now. However, we are on the dock. I'm there with my dad. I'm there with my brothers. There is another individual in front of us who is cleaning his fish who had been on the boat with us. And the last thing you have to know is that one of Captain Collie's teenage sons, he was probably 18, 19, he could have been 20, was helping all the people at the faucet as they came forward to clean their fish. So this other guy is in front of us. We're right behind him on the dock and he is cleaning his fish with the help of Captain Collie's son. And I guess it was taking a long time or something. I really wasn't aware. I was probably looking somewhere else or amusing myself in some way. But when this man in front of us 
walked away with his fish. He's finally done getting him cleaned. He walks away with his fish, and my dad steps forward, and we step forward to get our fish cleaned. Captain Collie's son looked at the guy who was leaving and whispers conspiratorially to my dad, yeah, that guy's probably a Jew. Now, I have no idea what it was that was going on that caused Captain Collie's son to refer to that other guy as a Jew. Not only that, I had no idea what on earth a Jew even was at that time in my life. But it was obvious that it was some kind of a slur, some kind of a dirty name that he was calling this other person as they were leaving and out of earshot. And he was saying it to my dad, expecting that my dad would agree with him in some way. But not only did my dad not agree with that sentiment, he got very upset by it. Now, I can't recall him saying anything about it, but when you are a little boy, let me just speak to myself. When I was a little boy and my dad would get mad, I could tell because the temperature would seem to go down about 20 degrees. And I remember being with him on the dock, behind him on the dock, when Captain Collie's teenage son told him that, saying, that guy must be a Jew. All of a sudden out here in what must have been a 90 to 100 degree day on the Gulf of Mexico, the temperature went down 20 or 30 degrees. And all of a sudden it got very chilly. And I knew, even standing behind my dad, not looking at his face, that he was very, very upset by this. I don't know if he said anything. He certainly did not respond by saying, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think he ignored him, got very terse, cleaned the fish, and then left. I don't recall ever asking my dad about what that was about afterward, but I knew it happened at the time. I was aware of what was going on. I knew he was mad, and I knew it had to do with Captain Collie's son calling this other guy a Jew. So why do I bring that up? I think I bring it up to give you an idea of the character of my dad, but also the fact that even though he's an atheist, there are some people out there who think that atheists can't have morals or any kind of ethics or any kind of righteousness about them, that the only time anybody tries to do good in this world is because they have to believe that there is a God above who's going to judge them at the last day on what they do, whether it's good or evil. And that's the only reason people do good. I might have fallen into the mistake of believing that, except for the example of my dad, whom I knew was an atheist and who I knew also had a very, very strong moral compass. And this story is an example of that kind of thing. I'll also tell you that after I got back from my mission and I was visiting my dad at his office and talking with him, I noticed that he had a plaque on his wall with a bunch of other plaques. But I'm wandering around his office looking at the plaques and I see one that is on his wall and it has a motto on it. And the motto said, the best way to get what you want out of life is to help other people get what they want out of life. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, that sounds an awful lot like the golden rule, just reconfigured a bit, reworded a bit, but that's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The best way to get what you want out of life is to help other people get what they want out of life. Yeah, it's basically equivalent. And I, I thought, isn't that interesting that my dad, the atheist, has this motto on his wall, which he thinks is important enough to display and which, in some sense, he lives by, that the golden rule is not the monopoly or exclusive property of Christianity or any religion, but actually the wisdom in it could be seen and adopted by a person who did not believe in God at all. I thought that was interesting, and I remember that to this day. I want to tell you this next story that happened in the mid-1980s. It has to do with church, and it has to do with my dad. And it was probably one of the most important things I ever learned in the LDS church. I remember going to church one day. I can't remember if it was Father's Day or what day it was, but the speaker, who was a high councilman, I think, actually said something that struck me. Now, as background, you have to understand that my dad, having been born in 1919, was raised himself in a time period when the father was somewhat removed, somewhat austere, and was basically present in the family life, as far as the kids were concerned, mainly to be the enforcer for mom. Now, I don't mean to say that my dad never did anything with us kids. He would take us on bicycle rides. Sometimes he would take us bowling. And we did do things together. But 
he was not very demonstrative with his affections. That's what he learned growing up. And that is how he behaved as a father to us as well. So I would say that I could not remember his ever having told us that he loves us. That was just something that he had difficulty saying. These were words that he was not comfortable saying because they probably never been said to him by his dad. And so he's going to follow the example knowingly or unknowingly and treat his children in the same way. So I'm in my mid twenties. It's the mid eighties, 1980s, and I'm going to church and the high councilman who's speaking is talking about fathers. And he's saying, you know, when you go home today after church, you should call up your dad and tell him that you love him. Now, that really struck me. And the reason it struck me is because I think I had told my dad I love him about as often as he had told me that he loves me. It kind of goes reciprocal in that way. And it was a challenge to me. And it was a bit of a scary challenge for me to call up my dad and tell him that I love him. That's how awkward that situation loomed in my mind. But I also knew that I really needed to do that. So I called him up, I talked with him briefly, and I ended the phone call with an awkward, I love you, dad. There was a pause on the other end, and he said back to me, I love you too, son. And you know, after that, every time we talked, I would tell him that I love him, and he would tell me that he loved me. That one instance of my telling my dad that I loved him changed our entire relationship in a meaningful way. And so I'm always grateful to the fact that I was at the LDS church that day to hear that message and that I acted on it. And by the way, if any of you out there have a mom or a dad or anyone in your life that you haven't said, I love you too, in a long period of time, you might want to give it a try. It made a big difference for me in my relationship with my dad. It might help you in a similar way if you have a situation like I had with my dad. Now, my dad was the only atheist in the family. My mom, as I said, was a nominal Christian. She didn't go to church, but she did have a grounding in Christianity, which she believed for her entire life, as far as I know, even though she was not a church-going type of person. I was a Mormon. Another brother was a Jehovah's Witness, and it was the oldest brother who seemed he was going to follow in dad's atheist footsteps, and he did for a long period of time, but then in his older years, he ended up becoming a Baptist, I think it is. So my dad then was the only atheist at that point. However, oddly enough, it seems like it is the Mormon son, i.e. me, who is most closely following my dad's atheism at this point. Now, I would not call myself an atheist. There are too many things that I don't know, too many things that I have questions about, too many things that I've experienced for me to be an out-and-out atheist. But I would say that among the members of the family, I'm probably most closely aligned with my dad. I don't know exactly what I am at this point, but I also don't want to spend a whole lot of time thinking about it and figuring it out just so that other people can put a label on me, if you know what I mean. As I mentioned, the one condition that my dad had for me when I joined the Mormon church was don't try to convert me, and I never did. Now, the one thing religion has to entice people, or at least the major thing that religion has to entice people to join, is rewards in the next life. It is the fact that if you join this church, this is the right church, this is the church that will make God happy if you join, so God will reward you in the next life. And if you don't join the right church, well, then you're not going to get those rewards. Sometimes you're going to get some punishments, sometimes eternal punishments, depending upon the church. But dad didn't want to live forever. So I guess I did have some conversations with him about religion at some point in time or other. Otherwise, why would he have mentioned it, right? Hmm. I guess I did try to convert him anyway. Well, what can I say? I'm a Mormon. That's what Mormons do. But dad would tell me he wasn't interested in living forever. And that was a real difficult thing for me to understand to comprehend someone who really didn't want to live forever. I mean, he told me so, and he told me so on multiple occasions, which is why I remember it. It didn't make sense to 20-something-year-old me, who not only wanted to live forever, but like many 20-something-year-olds, I thought I was going to live forever. But yes, living forever was something that I really wanted to do, and my dad said he didn't want to live forever. 
And when you talk with a person who doesn't want to live forever, it's very difficult to come up with a sales pitch for Mormonism or probably pretty much any other religion as well. But as I went through my life and year piled upon year and decade upon decade and experience upon experience, I came to understand what my dad meant by not wanting to live forever because I feel similarly to my dad now in that respect. And my dad did not live forever. He passed away at the age of 91 years old on March 9th, 2011, the day before my birthday. And I began to wonder, why is it that I don't have this keenness anymore to live forever? In fact, living forever sounds like more of a burden than a blessing. And I thought, it isn't just going through difficult experiences in life, though that is part of it. It also has to do with a belief system such as Mormonism that constantly has to be propped up by excuses and reasons. And those reasons can sometimes be ridiculous. And it doesn't really make any difference whether that belief system is Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or a different form of religion altogether. Rare is the religion that doesn't require a lot of buttressing to keep it together when life starts coming down like golf ball sized hail from the heavens. I've been doing everything I'm supposed to do. Why is my life going down the toilet? Or this other guy doesn't follow any of the commandments and yet is blessed with happiness and plenty. How do I explain that? What about the innocent people of the world? What about the children of the world? Abused, maltreated, starving, all through no fault of their own. Where is God in all of this? Many people who think about these questions for any time at all have to come up with excuses for God that will try not only their faith, but their intellect. Over time, this tends to create a great deal of cognitive dissonance. And this cognitive dissonance seems to be quite common among people who live a life of belief that God is great and God is good and God loves his children oh so very much. Because when you take that template of belief and place it next to the world and what I see in the world, what I see in my life, what I see in the lives of others, there's cognitive dissonance all over the place. And that cognitive dissonance can be its own burden. Now, last year, I read a book called Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maugham. And there's a wonderful passage in it, which I'm going to read to you, having to do with atheism, having to do with this idea about not necessarily wanting to live forever. Because frequently, when a person does not believe in God, then the question arises, what is the meaning of life? Isn't that the great selling point of religion? Isn't that the great selling point of Mormonism? It will tell you what the meaning of life is. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going after this life is over? That is the great bonus of having a religion. It tells you what the meaning of life is. If you take religion away, if you take God away, then what is the purpose of life? That is the question. And this is a question that is explored in this novel of human bondage. Of human bondage is a coming of age story like David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, with which it is often compared. Only of human bondage is much grittier and reflects reality to a greater degree. It is like the R-rated version of David Copperfield. And I want to show it to you here right now so you can see this is the paperback version which I read. Very, very fascinating book. It's an incredible work of literature. And in it, the protagonist is Philip Carey, who is trying to make his way in the world and find out who he is and what it is he wants to do with his life. He leaves his native England and goes to France to study art because he has a passion for art. And he's rather young at this time. And he falls in with all sorts of characters. One of these characters is named Cronshaw, C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. Cronshaw, a man older and presumably wiser than Philip, who intimates that he, Cronshaw, has discovered the meaning of life. And Cronshaw is an atheist. Philip asks him several times over the years, what is the meaning of life that Cronshaw has discovered? Every time Philip asks him this question, Cronshaw demurs and says that he's not going to tell him the answer of what the meaning of life is because it doesn't mean anything unless you discover it for yourself. 
At one point in the story, Cronshaw gives Philip a Persian rug, a small Persian rug that he says contains the secret of the meaning of life, but that Philip will have to figure it out for himself. Finally, Cronshaw dies. But Cronshaw is so much older than Philip, it doesn't hit him as hard as when later in the book, he finds out that a dear friend of his from his youth named Hayward has died. And in this scene, Philip has just found out that Hayward has died. This puts Philip in a pensive state and he goes to the British Museum. He's in England now, of course. He goes to the British Museum to look at the artwork there for solace, as he often does. Eventually, while meditating on everything that has happened to him, Philip realizes the meaning of life. He has to reason himself there. And this will be a bit long. It's several pages, but I guarantee you it is absolutely worth every word of it. So I'm going to read a little bit from this book of human bondage, which I read last year, 2023, which was incredibly meaningful to me in a number of different ways, but none more than in this particular passage. So I think I've told you enough about the background of the story for you to be able to follow along as I read. So here it is of human bondage by W. Somerset Mom. And here are some screenshots I have of pages that I picked up on the internet that covered this aspect of the story. Starting with the first full paragraph here. But presently, the influence of the place descended upon him, the place being the British Museum, of course. He felt quieter. He began to look absently at the tombstones with which the room was lined. They were the work of Athenian stonemasons of the 4th and 5th centuries before Christ. And they were very simple, work of no great talent, but with the exquisite spirit of Athens upon them. Time had mellowed the marble to the color of honey, so that unconsciously one thought of the bees of Hymetus and softened their outlines. Some represented a nude figure seated on a bench, some the departure of the dead from those who loved him, and some the dead clasping hands with one who remained behind. On all was the tragic word, farewell, that and nothing more. Their simplicity was infinitely touching. Friend parted from friend, the son from his mother, and the restraint made the survivor's grief more poignant. It was so long, long ago, and century upon century had passed over that unhappiness. For 2,000 years, those who wept had been dust as those they wept for. Yet the woe was alive still. And it filled Philip's heart so that he felt compassion spring up in it. And he said, poor things, poor things. And it came to him that the gaping sightseers and the strangers with their guidebooks and all those mean common people who thronged the shop with their trivial desires and vulgar cares were mortal and must die. They too loved and must part from those they loved. The son from his mother the wife from her husband, and perhaps it was more tragic because their lives were ugly and sordid, and they knew nothing that gave beauty to the world. There was one stone which was very beautiful, a base relief of two young men holding each other's hand, and the reticence of line, the simplicity, made one like to think that the sculptor here had been touched with a genuine emotion. It was an exquisite memorial to that than which the world offers but one thing more precious, to a friendship. And as Philip looked at it, he felt the tears come to his eyes. He thought of Hayward and his eager admiration for him when first they met, and how disillusion had come, and then indifference, till nothing held them together but habit and old memories. It was one of the queer things of life, that you saw a person every day, for months, and were so intimate with him that you could not imagine existence without him. Then separation came, and everything went on in the same way. And the companion, who had seemed essential, proved unnecessary. Your life proceeded, and you did not even miss him. Philip thought of those early days in Heidelberg, when Hayward, capable of great things, had been full of enthusiasm for the future, and how, little by little, Achieving nothing, he had resigned himself to failure. Now he was dead. 
his death had been as futile as his life. He died ingloriously of a stupid disease, failing once more, even at the end, to accomplish anything. It was just the same now as if he had never lived. Philip asked himself desperately, what was the use of living at all? It all seemed inane. It was the same with Cronshaw, remember the older friend of his? It was quite unimportant that he had lived. He was dead and forgotten. His book of poems sold in remainder by second-hand booksellers. His life seemed to have served nothing except to give a pushing journalist occasion to write an article in a review. And Philip cried out in his soul, what is the use of it? That's the question. What is the point of life? What is the use of living at all under circumstances such as these? The effort was so incommensurate with the result. The bright hopes of youth had to be paid for at such a bitter price of disillusionment. Pain and disease and unhappiness weighed down the scale so heavily. What did it all mean? He thought of his own life, the high hopes with which he had entered upon it, the limitations which his body forced upon him. He has a club foot, by the way. That's the limitations that it's talking about, the limitations which his body forced upon him, his friendlessness and the lack of affection which had surrounded his youth. He did not know that he had ever done anything but what seemed best to do, and what a cropper he had come. He only tries to do the best thing, and yet he makes a mess of it. Other men, with no more advantages than he, succeeded, and others again, with many more, failed. It seemed pure chance. The rain fell alike upon the just and upon the unjust, and for nothing was there a why and a wherefore. Thinking of Cronshaw, Philip remembered the Persian rug, which he had given him, telling him that it offered an answer to his question about the meaning of life. And suddenly, the answer occurred to him. He chuckled. Now that he had it, it was like one of the puzzles which you worry over till you are shown the solution and then cannot imagine how it could ever have escaped you. The answer was obvious. Life had no meaning. On the earth, satellite of a star speeding through space, living things had arisen under the influence of conditions which were part of the planet's history. And as there had been a beginning of life upon it, so under the influence of other conditions, there would be an end. Man, no more significant than other forms of life, had come not as the climax of creation, but as a physical reaction to the environment. Philip remembered the story of the Eastern king, who desiring to know the history of man was brought by a sage 500 volumes. Busy with affairs of state, he bade him go and condense it. In 20 years, the sage returned, and his history now was in no more than 50 volumes. But the king, too old then to read so many ponderous tomes, bade him go and shorten it once more. Twenty years passed again, and the sage, old and gray, brought a single book in which was the knowledge the king had sought. But the king lay on his deathbed, and he had no time to read even that. And then the sage gave him the history of man in a single line. It was this. He was born, he suffered, and he died. There was no meaning in life and man, by living, served no end. It was immaterial whether he was born or not born, whether he lived or ceased to live. Life was insignificant and death without consequence. Philip exulted as he had exulted in his boyhood when the weight of a belief in God was lifted from his shoulders. It seemed to him that the last burden of responsibility was taken from him, and for the first time, he was utterly free. His insignificance was turned to power, and he felt himself suddenly equal with the cruel fate which had seemed to persecute him. For if life was meaningless, the world was robbed of its cruelty. What he did or left undone did not matter. 
failure was unimportant and success amounted to nothing. He was the most inconsiderable creature in that swarming mass of mankind, which for a brief space occupied the surface of the earth. And he was almighty. So he's inconsiderable. He's nothing. But he's also almighty. He was almighty because he had wrenched from chaos the secret of its nothingness. Thoughts came tumbling over one another in Philip's eager fancy, and he took long breaths of joyous satisfaction. He felt inclined to leap and sing. He had not been so happy for months. O oh life, he cried in his heart, O oh life, where is thy sting? And I've got to tell you, when I read this part, I did laugh out loud for joy at this wonderful turning of the phrase of Paul, O oh death, where is thy sting? He takes that, turns it around and says, O oh life, where is thy sting? Now that I know that there is no meaning to you, all the sting that you give me is taken away and I am free from this great burden of trying to find meaning in something that is itself meaningless. For the same uprush of fancy, which had shown him with all the force of mathematical demonstration that life had no meaning, brought with it another idea. And that was why Cronshaw, he imagined, had given him the Persian rug. As the weaver elaborated his pattern for no end but the pleasure of his aesthetic sense, so might a man live his life. Or if one was forced to believe that his actions were outside his choosing, in other words, that we don't have free will, so might a man look at his life that it made a pattern. There was as little need to do this as there was use. It was merely something he did for his own pleasure. Out of the manifold events of his life, his deeds, his feelings, his thoughts, he might make a design, regular, elaborate, complicated, or beautiful. And though it might be no more than an illusion that he had the power of selection, i.e. that he has free will, that's another issue they deal with in the book. And though it be no more than an illusion that he had the power of selection, though it might be no more than a fantastic ledger domain in which appearances were interwoven with moonbeams, that did not matter. It seemed, and so to him, it was, in the vast warp of life, a river arising from no spring and flowing endlessly to no sea. With the background to his fancies that there was no meaning and that nothing was important, a man might get a personal satisfaction in selecting the various strands that worked out the pattern. There was one pattern, the most obvious, perfect, and beautiful, in which a man was born, grew to manhood, married, produced children, toiled for his bread, and died. But there were others, intricate and wonderful, in which happiness did not enter, and in which success was not attempted. And in them might be discovered a more troubling grace. Some lives, and Hayward's was among them, the blind indifference of chance cut off while the design was still imperfect, and then the solace was comforting that it did not matter. Other lives, such as Cronshaw's, offered a pattern which was difficult to follow. The point of view had to be shifted, and old standards had to be altered before one could understand that such a life was its own justification. Philip thought that in Throwing over the desire for happiness, he was casting aside the last of his illusions. His life had seemed horrible when it was measured by its happiness. But now he seemed to gather strength as he realized that it might be measured by something else. Happiness mattered as little as pain. They came in, both of them, as all the other details of his life came in, to the elaboration of the design. He seemed for an instant to stand above the accidents of his existence, and he felt that they could not affect him again as they had done before. Whatever happened to him now would be one more motive to add to the complexity of the pattern. And when the end approached, he would rejoice in its completion. It would be a work of art, and it would be nonetheless beautiful because he alone knew of its existence. And with his death, it would at once cease to be. And the chapter concludes, Philip was happy. So this was very powerful to me when I read it. And I know that there are a number of people out there 
who don't hold this view, who assume that people who do hold this view, which is somewhat nihilistic in nature, must be very, very unhappy. They have no source of happiness. They're not looking forward to eternal life. They're going to die. They're going to cease existing. Life has no meaning imposed upon it by an outside God or an outside religion. And therefore, such people must be miserable. But here in this passage, we can see that such people can and indeed often are the happiest of all people because they've realized that life has no meaning, that they can give up their illusions, that it does have a meaning, and it's those illusions which keep making them miserable as life continues to fail to live up to those illusions that they have. Indeed, O oh life, where is thy sting? Now again, I'm not saying that this is my own personal view, but the title of the podcast is In Defense of Atheism, and I thought this passage is very compelling as it portrays a very positive aspect to what otherwise we would look at as something that would be absolute misery. No, it's actually the apex of happiness, according to this passage. So I wanted to share it with you. There's also one other thing I want to share with you before I go tonight, and that is a passage from a poem that deals with this. And it deals with this whole idea that my dad brought to my attention when he said he doesn't want to live forever. I thought, how can anybody not want to live forever? Now I'm 64. I can understand a little bit better why somebody might not want to live forever. And I was reading a collection of poems a few years ago. It's in this book called A Treasury of Classic Poetry. So there's a bunch of poems in here. And this particular poem that I'm going to read one stanza of, not the entire poem, is called The Garden of Proserpine. It's by Algernon Charles Swinburne. He lived from 1837 to 1909. And let's see what he has to say about the idea of not wanting to live forever in this stanza. Here it is. From too much love of living, he writes, from too much love of living, from hope and fear set free, we thank with brief thanksgiving, whatever gods may be, that no life lives forever, that dead men rise up Never, that even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. Well, I thought that was so well articulated that it brought home to me and helped me understand what my dad meant when he said to me that he did not want to live forever and that he was not the only one who's felt this way, that others such as this poet Swinburne also felt the way and managed to put this sentiment in verse in such a way as to make it both beautiful and compelling at the same time. Well, that is about all for my presentation on In Defense of Atheism. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please hit like. Please hit subscribe. Let's get those subscription numbers up if we possibly can. It helps with the algorithm as well as so many other things. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I know I've enjoyed putting it together for you. I want to end this episode by dedicating it to my father. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for everything. I love you. I miss you. I'm glad you're my dad. You'll always be my dad. Good night.